I want you to listen to this song. It's a 1926 recording of the song Always, performed by musician Nick Lucas. I'll be loving you always Where the love that's true always Now listen to this version by Frank Sinatra in 1947. I'll be loving you always with a love that's true always. There are obvious differences between the two recordings. First, Lucas is a tenor and Sinatra is a baritone. Lucas transposed the song to the key of D so he could sing the melody higher. The tempo of Sinatra's version is also much slower. And Lucas wasn't really a singer at all. He started his career as a jazz guitarist. But maybe the biggest difference of all is how Sinatra sings the song. Sinatra famously said his instrument wasn't his voice, but his microphone. In the 1920s, electric microphone technology was just being introduced into popular music. But by the 40s, Sinatra had mastered it. Sinatra's rendition of Always feels timeless because he's using a microphone to create a feeling. Days may not be fair always. The microphone helped cement the singer as the centerpiece of pop music in the 20th century and actually changed the way we sing about love. Not for just an hour. Not for just a day. Being heard has always been important in performance. The ancient Greeks built theaters with acoustics that allowed actors to be heard all the way in the back. And opera singers used crazy vocal techniques to project their voices at frequencies that could be heard over the orchestra. Before the microphone, singing required a lot of training and talent. For that reason, much of popular music recorded in the early 20th century didn't feature a vocalist. This was partially a matter of taste, but it was also because vocals were difficult to record. Before the widespread adoption of the microphone in 1925, music was recorded acoustically. Musicians performed in front of a big metal horn that funneled sound through a vibrating diaphragm. The diaphragm caused a stylus to etch the recording onto a wax disc. There was no tone controls. For singers, this meant running in front of the band to sing their part directly into the horn and quickly moving away when they were done. This analog process could only capture a limited range of audio frequencies for voices. Baritones could be too low and sopranos ran the risk of being too high. As a result, early recordings favored a high tenor's range. The electric microphone was being tinkered with throughout the 20s but really took off with the radio broadcast. The microphone allowed a voice to be converted into an electrical signal and that signal could be amplified. A singer with a mic didn't have to sing louder. And on the radio, his voice could travel much farther than the concert hall. Before the microphone, tenor Rudy Vallee sang through a megaphone, a tough act to pull off when crowds would try to pitch pennies into the funnel. It's no surprise then that he was one of the earliest singers to embrace the microphone. Vallee felt at home in the radio studio mainly because the mic helped bring out his soft, sweet singing style. Valet was a crooner. Crooning was a lullaby-like singing that took off in the late 20s. Crooners had a signature warble of bouncing between notes in the melody, like Valet does here in his 1929 hit, Honey. Seen in the June night, flooded with moonlight, fragrant roses in bloom, garden dance with just this subtle vibrato wasn't really possible with the lower fidelity acoustic recordings of a few years prior. Singing softly into a microphone lets singers play with inflection to paint a sweeter picture of the moonlight and the lovers on the bench. And female listeners loved it. Crooners were the first true American pop stars. Filet was appearing in Hollywood movies and being mobbed by adoring fans. Suddenly, singers were in high demand. Band leaders were pulling musicians off the bandstand to sing. Russ Colombo was a violinist before hitting it big as a crooner in the 1930s. Crooning was the new language of love, as new singing superstar Bing Crosby made clear. Learn to croon 
if you want to win your heart's desire. Sweet melodies of love inspire romance. The introduction of the ribbon microphone in the 30s allowed for a much wider spectrum of vocal frequencies, and singers started to experiment with different styles and nuance. Crosby was famous for his beautiful legato phrasing, flowing effortlessly between notes. It made songs like this into classics. I'm of a Billie Holiday was an innovator on the mic. She developed a tone and rhythm that sounded like she was speaking the lyrics instead of singing them, like she was passing on a rumor or a secret. Someday you come along, the man I love, and he'll be big and strong, the man I love. The way she used the mic, according to biographer John Jouette, created a feeling of a live performance, like she was walking around a cabaret singing to audience members as she passed by their tables. Like I said earlier, Sinatra was a master of the microphone. He tailored his entire singing style to take full advantage of the technology. He would tilt his head or move away from the mic to remove the harsh sounds caused by semblance and plosives, the sharp S and percussive B and P sounds that our voices make and mics are notorious for picking up. Sinatra's mic only picked up the sounds he wanted it to. His technique made the microphone dissolve, giving his voice a disarming presence, a lover whispering sweet nothings in your ear. I'll be loving you always. Singers like Crosby, Sinatra, and Holiday realized early on the microphone was a tool one that could bring nuance and depth to their singing. That's why we still listen to their recordings today. And the styles they pioneered still influence modern crooners. Love is a complex spectrum of emotions, and the mic has just helped us hear them all as clearly as possible. Who's your favorite crooner and what is your favorite love song? Comment below and like and subscribe for more Cheddar Deep Dives and Breakdowns. And make sure you turn on notifications because we would love that. So you know when we're dropping new videos.